Hey guys, it's no secret that over the centuries, uh, people that claim the name of Christ have really struggled to understand God's grace. We have really struggled to wrap our heads around this concept that salvation is a free gift of God, that it's not of ourselves, that it's by the pure unmerited favor of God. Um, it's no secret that Christianity over the centuries has really, really struggled with this issue and they still struggle with it today. And I noticed that in the comments of my last video where I talked about the analogies of the gospel. And yet this issue is one of life and death. This is of dire importance that we understand that in order for a person to be saved, they must come to the end of themselves and realize that salvation comes purely as a free gift of God by his unmerited favor. And if we cannot come to this understanding, if we refuse to die to self, uh, put down our own efforts and our own self-righteousness, and put all of our trust in the Savior, um, if we refuse to do this, we cannot be saved. And so this is an issue of dire importance. And I don't like using fear in my videos. I don't like fear at all. It's a negative emotion. Um, it's not for the body of Christ. We've not been given a spirit of fear and bondage. We've been given a spirit of sonship that cries out, Abba, Father. John says that those who fear have not been made perfect in love, for fear has to do with punishment. Uh, we're not under punishment. There is no condemnation for us. And so fear isn't really for the body of Christ. Fear is for the unbeliever. That's why scripture says, fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. It's not the end game. It's not the goal. Uh, the goal of fear and the law is to lead people to the grace of God, all right? So fear is the beginning of knowledge, but it's not the end game. But unfortunately, just as Jesus did in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthews 5 through 7, sometimes fear is necessary to break people, to get them to come to the end of themselves and recognize the futility of their own efforts in trying to be made right with God by the law. And so that's what we're going to be doing in this video today. Um, we're going to be using the law lawfully the way Jesus did in his Sermon on the Mount to hopefully get people to understand um, that you must come to the end of yourself. You must get to the point where you are the tax collector in Jesus's parable and not the Pharisee, where you will not even look up to heaven because you know that you're condemned, that you are unworthy, and that your only hope is the unmerited free gift of favor and grace and mercy of God that you don't dare list off your works or your self-righteousness before him, that your only plea to God is that he might save you. That is the place that every person must come to if they wish to be saved. The person who is like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, who is still clinging to his own righteousness and his own efforts in any way, who dares to stand, in front of the Most High God, thinking in the foolishness of his mind that he has done something or earned something that makes him worthy of being in his presence, that person is a fool. And they will be booted firmly right out of heaven as a thief and a robber. The one who walked away justified was the tax collector who didn't even dare look up to heaven who knew there was nothing that he could offer God for his own justification. And he put his full trust in appealing to the mercy and unmerited grace of God. That person walks away justified and not the former. If you are the Pharisee who is trying to add you and your efforts into the gospel message, you are in dire trouble. You are in danger of the fires of hell. I don't often speak like this in my videos because my videos are mostly geared towards my brothers and sisters and encouraging them. But I would not be loving you if I did not warn you that you are in danger if you are putting your trust in something other than the Savior. I'm gonna show you what Jesus was showing the religious in Matthew chapter five through seven in his Sermon on the Mount. This is the law. This is the mighty, great standard of the law. And God's law is a reflection of his perfect holiness. 
In God, there is no flaw, there is no sin, there is no darkness. He is pure, unadulterated perfection. In God, there is no gray area when it comes to him and sin. God does not judge on a curve. He does not give sin a pass. He cannot be in the presence of sin. It is against his very nature. Even one sin, no matter how small you think it is, whether you stole a candy bar when you were a kid or you told a little, little white lie or you murdered somebody and buried him in your backyard, it's all bad to God. And all of it, no matter how little or how big, will keep you out of heaven. James says to stumble in any way is to break all of God's laws. To break even one of God's laws is to break all of them. There are 613. Good luck. So this is God's standard. Jesus tells us that to even look with lust, you have already committed adultery. <coughs> to harbor bitterness or unforgiveness or to call someone a fool, you're a murderer. It's not just what you do, Jesus says. It's what's happening in here and in here that God's law pierces. God's law pierces bone and marrow and flesh and goes right into the deepest recesses of a man. Your deepest, darkest secrets are going to be revealed on the day of judgment. This is the true standard of God's law. Absolute perfection. It's not try your best and God will do the rest. No, no, no. It's absolute perfection. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is God's standard of the law. You are here. No matter what you do or how hard you try, you will never be here. And in fact, the harder that you try, the more that you will fail. Because God's word says that the law is the strength and power of sin. So God has provided a way for you. By becoming a man, incarnating as a man in the person of Jesus Christ. He did what you could not. Everywhere we failed, he succeeded. Every law we broke, he kept. He lived a perfect, sinless life on your behalf. He met the standard of God's law on your behalf. And every one of us have a choice. We can try to continue to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and be like God and by our own efforts try and keep his laws and earn our righteousness. And Jesus says to those people, you better be ready to pluck out your own eyes and cut off your own hands because if you ever even look with lust, you're an adulterer. You better be ready to gouge out your own eyes so that you can't even look. If you're tempted to steal, you better cut off your hand. If that's the way you're choosing to be made right with God, you better be ready to go the mile because you better believe that Jesus was not being sarcastic when he said, pluck out your eye and cut off your hand. The King of Kings was being dead serious. Dead serious. He meant what he said and he means what he, he says what he means and he means what he says. He wasn't being sarcastic. It wasn't hyperbole. Jesus meant it. You who think you're righteous, who are confident in your own righteousness, who are trusting in Moses to be your redemption, you better be ready to pluck out your own eyes and cut off your hand. If that's the way that you're choosing to be made right with God, you better be sure on the day of judgment that you are perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Because if you even have one blemish, out, fires of hell for you for all eternity. All liars, all fearful, all cowards, all who have ever sinned in any way into the lake of fire, the Bible says. There is no mercy. There is no give. There is no grading on a curve. There is no gray area when it comes to God's law. It's set in stone and that stone will crush you. If that stone is not crushing you when you hear it, 
if the words that I'm telling you right now are not causing you to be terrified, then you haven't heard the true standard of the law. If someone else's version of the law didn't cause you to be terrified, you have not heard the true standard of the law. Because the law should terrify every single one of us. It should make you cower in fear like a little girl. Because that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to crush you and condemn you and bury you under its weight so that you lose all hope of choosing that way. And you become like the tax collector who won't even look up to heaven and said, God have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. That man will walk away justified, not the fool who thinks that he can keep God's law. Now some will say, well, I'm not the one keeping the law. When I came to be saved, God helps me keep the law now. Here's the problem with that. As I said before, God is perfect. When it comes to God and sin, there is no gray area. When you stand before him, God is not going to say, oh, well, you tried your best. Oh, well, you know what? That's a little sin. I'm going to let that pass. You will either stand before him as perfect and without blemish, or you will be cast out of his presence. There is no gray area with God and sin. There is no mercy and there is no give when it comes to the law of God. You're either perfect or you're filthy. God does not grade on a curve. The only way to be made right with God, to be able to stand in the presence of the Most High God, is if you receive the righteousness of another. If one man, Jesus Christ, were to take all of the sins that you have ever or will ever commit upon himself, he who knew no sin became sin, so that you may become the righteousness of God. He took all of the sins you would ever or will ever commit, upon himself, died on the cross paying the penalty of those sins, and then gave to you his righteousness as a white robe. That is the only way you will stand before the Most High God, cleansed by the blood. Not because you lived righteous from the point on that you became a Christian, not because you never sinned again, not because you kept the law from the point that you became a Christian onward, because we all know you're lying, you haven't kept the law, you still sin, even as a Christian. The only way you will stand before the Most High God on the Day of Judgment, perfect and without blemish, is because the one who knew no sin became sin, so that you may become the righteousness of God. It's an imputed righteousness, Romans chapter 4. The one who works not, but trusts on the one who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. David speaks likewise of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Meaning the righteousness that you must have before God is not a righteousness based on works, but a righteousness that you receive credited by faith in Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3, that I be found in him, not with the righteousness of my own by the law, but by God's righteousness that comes by faith in Christ. It's a credited righteousness. It's a foreign righteousness. It's a righteousness that you didn't earn, that's not yours, it's his, imputed to your account. How can I say this? Because you are not glorified yet, and neither am I. If you are to be perfect in this life, then you would be glorified in this life, and you would never die. Here's the problem. That flesh that you walk around in, unless you're raptured, it's going to die. Because it's not sanctified, and you're not glorified. That's what I mean by an imputed righteousness. Your flesh still sins. So if you think you're going to stand before God on the day of judgment with your raggedy, imperfect righteousness, and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been so sinless in your life. 
you're fooling yourselves and you are going to have a very bad day on the day of judgment because there is no other name that a man might be saved but by Jesus. And there is no righteousness that one can attain but his. All the glory is the Son of God's and none of it is yours. If that offends you, too bad. Get over it. Grace ain't fair. And you better thank your lucky stars that grace ain't fair because if it was, every single one of us would be rotting in hell for eternity. Grace ain't fair. It's a free gift. And you better thank God every, every day that it ain't fair because if it was, you'd be going to hell and so would I. But God made it easy. He did what you could never do. He justified us from everything the law of Moses never could. And he made it so simple that all you have to do is trust on him. Put your full faith and your full trust in what he did on your behalf. And when you do, you shall never die. John chapter 5, the one who believes in me will never come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. The one who believes in me will never come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. Let that sink in. Guys, I don't like using fear, but some people need to be afraid. Some people need to be very afraid because they don't understand the law that they're trying to keep. They don't, under, they don't, they don't understand the law that they are placing themselves under, and they don't understand the consequences. There is no mercy in the law. There is no grace in the law. Law and grace are mutually exclusive. They are not mixed. You can't do a little grace and a little law. It's either law or grace, life or death, tree of, no tree of knowledge of good and evil or tree of life. You can't have both. You got to pick Jesus or Moses. It can't be both. It's one or the other. We need to get this through our heads, guys, because this is of dire importance. This is life and death. We need to come to the end of ourselves, surrender, wave the white flag. God, I can't do it. Save me. Have mercy. But I can tell you one thing for certain. You're not going to find mercy in Moses. And if you're looking for mercy in Moses, you don't know Moses. I love you guys.